What's up, Pool Chasers? In case you haven't heard, we announced the first ever Pool Chasers Mixer in Las Vegas. It will be during the International Pool and Spa Show. It'll be on Thursday night, November 1st at 4.30 p.m. It's going to be at Stoney's Rocking Country. It's going to be a great time, guys. You're going to be surrounded with like-minded individuals who want to learn, grow, and share knowledge just like you. It's going to be an unforgettable time. Tickets include dinner, special Pool Chasers hat, a special custom pin, and two drink tickets. It's all worth it, guys. We're also going to bring our recording equipment so we can kind of hear some of your guys' stories as well to get you on an episode of the podcast. So it's going to be a great, amazing time, and we just don't want you guys to miss out on that So, you know, tickets are going fast, so please sign up ASAP if you want to attend. We can't wait to see you guys. So if you guys want to RSVP for the Pool Chasers Mixer in Las Vegas at Stoney's Rockin' Country, you can go to www.poolchasers.com and go to the Events tab, and that'll actually open up another window on Eventbrite where you can actually um, pay the $100 and RSVP. So all your information will get in there. And that's uh, that's pretty much it. But there's more details um, there as well. So you can kind of look over everything that we had talked about. Um, but yeah, it's that easy. And we really hope that you can make it. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Viafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. Well, thank you so much, Wayne, for visiting us all the way from the East Coast. We really appreciate yep. you being here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so let's jump into, you know, what your name mm-hmm. is and who you work who for. Who am I? <laughs> yeah. We want to know about Taylor. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, my name is Wayne Ivasich. I'm the manager for... Uh, technical services and education at Taylor. Uh, I just mentioned earlier, I'll be starting my 28th year at Taylor on Monday, actually. Oh, um, congratulations. Uh, thank you. I'm a dinosaur officially there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, started out actually at Taylor as a technical writer because that's what my uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees are in, actually, is in, is in writing. And a um, couple years after that, they asked me if I was interested in going into sales. Sure. Why not? I'm game and did that for 20 some 22 years. I was the uh, pool and spa um, sales manager. I handled all of our distributors across the country in Canada and, and the world. Um, it was just two of us, myself and, and my boss back then. And then about five years ago, four years ago, um, Taylor started expanding a little bit and they, they always valued education um, uh, because the more people know, the more um, the more knowledgeable obviously they can become not only about testing, but about all aspects of, of, of pool and spas. And they um, asked me if I would start this department, this education department. And I said, perfect. This is exactly what I wanted to do because that's what I had been doing. Um, I probably taught two or 3,000 seminars, webinars, wow. classes over you know, the 27, 28 years with Taylor. A lot, that's a lot of people. <laughs> And um, this was just a natural progression for me. So that's all I do right now is that I, I teach classes at trade shows. I do the webinars that, that you guys are familiar, familiar with. I'm doing this today for, for you guys. Um, I do the CPO classes. I'm also an NSPF instructor, so I teach the instructor classes also when they're whole, held a few times a year. So uh, that's, that's my primary focus at Taylor. And as a result of that, what I also do is I uh, handle all of our technical uh, questions that come in from outside the company, whether it's in an email or a phone call, uh, at trade shows, whatever they are. I handle all of those. Um, I do have backups in case I'm not there, like today. <laughs> um, but uh, and and probably get on an average uh, ten emails a day, maybe ten to fifteen calls a day from not only uh, service people but from homeowners too. So they have questions. They they find that little technical. Uh, question button on our website and they'll send in a question and I'll go ahead and answer it. And that's what I do. That's what I love to do. Very cool. That's we awesome. can definitely see how big you guys are on education. I mean, you mm-hmm. flew all the way here from where exactly? Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah. 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 So I know we contacted you probably about a month ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a campaign where we um, put together a really cool form just to kind of see you know, what struggles um, our listeners had and mm-hmm. a bunch of other things like that. And one of the biggest things that came up was just understanding water chemistry and just being um, a little bit more knowledgeable in that field. Right. So 
obviously we always wanted Taylor on, but after, you know, seeing that and almost, you know, one in ev- one in three forms, we're like, yeah, we got to make this happen soon. <laughs> um, so we definitely appreciate coming out here and yeah. um, talking about everything. So how, when did, um, so Taylor's been around for a long time. Right. Taylor's open started in, in 1930 and in, in a private home, actually, um, about 25 miles north of Baltimore. Um, only a few people worked worked there and there is there actually was a dr taylor way back when he's no longer with us obviously but um uh, he opened up a company that primarily did uh ph and chlorine testing for industrial applications and they moved over and added the pool spa segment in the 1950s and in the 70s they moved to the facilities where we are now obviously much bigger warehousing things like that manufacturing and the neat thing about taylor too is that we make everything that's in that test kit in at Taylor. Oh, wow. Yeah. The only exception is glass stuff. Uh, and that's not, there's nothing glass works, um, in, on the uh, pool spa side on the industrial side. There are, uh, but yeah, we make everything at Taylor. There's very few products that are done outside. Is the manufacturing plant in Baltimore as well? It's right next door to where my office is. Oh, wow. It's that whole facility right there. Yeah. It's in an area called Sparks, Maryland. It's, a lot of horse country, thoroughbred racing farms, things like that. Um, a very nice, nice area. But we're right off an interstate, so shipping is not an, an issue. And the <laughs> the industrial park we're in also is a UPS, um, mm-hmm. um, um, what, what do they call them, um, uh, delivery centers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's like, boom, daily, come, they come by like 4 o'clock every day to get <laughs> all the shipments out. <laughs> when I think yeah. of Baltimore, uh-huh. you know what I think about? Nope. Cal, Cal Ripken. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of Ripken jerseys around. Yep, there. yep. <laughs> and Cal Ripken and his brother Billy uh, oh, and his yeah. dad. Yeah, Cal Sr. Yeah, absolutely. A bunch of Ripkins. Yep. Mm-hmm. Did they all play for the Orioles? Uh, they all played for the Orioles, yeah. Well, obviously, Cal played his whole his whole um, 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 career. career there in, in Baltimore. Uh, Billy played for Baltimore for a little while, and then uh, he got out of Major League Baseball and is more uh, running the AAA um, baseball team that is affiliated with the Orioles, uh, the Aberdeen Ironbirds. Uh, and, uh, of course, Cal Sr. passed away a few years ago. Uh, but and he, is, he managed the Orioles for a number of years in the 90s and the early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, really nice people, too. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Billy's on MLB tonight all the time. I see uh-huh. him yeah. all the time mm-hmm. on there. He's, he's, he's cool. He's a really smart guy. Yeah, very, very intelligent, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Cal winds up just doing commercials. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he can he afford made enough to. money. Yeah, he made enough money. <laughs> nice. So, how did you get involved with the pool industry? I mean, I know you kind of, you know, you went to college and all yeah. that, but I fell into it. Uh, basically, I, I had worked for the state of Maryland at the University of Maryland downtown for a number of years, and in the um, late eighties, uh, the then governor um, like cut half the sa- uh, the uh, workforce for state employees, and I was one of them. So, But he did give us a, quite a bit of a notice. I got a six-month notice that I was going to be you know, terminated or laid off, whatever you want to call it. So I just started sending out resumes. And back then you had to mail out resumes. There was no such thing as Internet or email or cell phones or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, the, I backed into this because my wife is a nurse, and she worked with another nurse at a facility whose brother-in-law, okay, follow me on this one now, whose brother-in-law was then the vice president of production at Taylor. Mm. And in a conversation, she, the, the, the fellow nurse was having with her brother-in-law, they were saying, you know, we were looking for a technical writer, and she knew, well, wait a minute, I think I know somebody. So passed along the information to my wife who gave it to me. I sent in a resume. Uh, three months later, I started at Taylor. Nice. Yeah, wow. yeah, and so <laughs> it's meant to and, be. Meant, meant to be, and and I always kind of joke that I never took a chemistry course in high school um, because I was scared to death I was going to flunk it. So I joined, <laughs> I joined the band. So I skipped that year and went right from from like a lab science to, to physics. Uh, but when I went to college, you had to take a science, and so I took chemistry for non science majors, which pretty much meant open book. You know, um, the teachers read straight from the textbook every class. I knew math, so and it was pretty much math at that time, so I aced that course. That's all the chemistry I ever had. So everything that I've learned up till today, I learned on the job, which you, you can't pass that up. That's, you know, getting your hands wet. I've done acid washes. 
don't want to anymore, but I've done acid <laughs> well. You know, so I've gotten my hands dirty, literally. Uh, and everything I've learned, I learned from the people at Taylor. And I'm at that point now where I can pass that information along to new employees or, you know, for, through venues like this. Um, so I can explain things on a, on a practical basis, on a, on a same level kind of thing. Uh, it, yeah. It's kind of neat to say, yeah. That's crazy because we were just talking about that yesterday, how you have to physically go out and do the work so that you understand. Because if Absolutely. you don't actually go out and do it and you talk about it like mm-hmm. you know what's going on, mm-hmm. you don't. Right. You, you're right. never really going to understand and you're not going to make sense of anything if you don't go out there, get your hands dirty, Absolutely. get your hands wet. Absolutely. You know? Literally, get your hands wet. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes your body when you fall in. But no, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it'll fall in. No. I've fallen in twice. <laughs> I've, gone, I've gone half body. <laughs> you know who else is from Baltimore? Michael Phelps. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mike, Michael um, oh, actually. He lives here, though, right? He lives he has some, a house here. Yeah. Uh, Michael um, uh, trained at a center, uh, a swim center, not terribly far from downtown Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And Meadowbrook was the name of it. And uh, actually, my ex son in law used to swim with them when they were teenagers. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and um, um, so I kind of knew that we, well, he knew of the Phelpses and, and all that. And uh, but yeah, Michael's very Baltimore oriented, um, very, and he gives back to the Meadowbrook Swim Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, his coach is still there, based in there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Michael's, Michael's from yeah, there. He's a huge, uh, huge Ravens, Orioles. Oh, know. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Super yeah. Because him and uh, what's Ray his name? Lewis. Ray Lewis are good friends. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was going through all that stuff, and mm-hmm. Ray helped him out with Ray it. Ray helped him yep. out with a mm-hmm. bunch. That's yeah. pretty cool. And in fact, one of the preseason games last year, I was at with a couple friends, and they stopped the game to watch Michael get his last gold medal. At the Olympics, whenever that was, a couple of years ago or something. Yeah. No yeah. way. That was, well, yeah, we all had, you know, Michael Phelps things we <laughs> held up. It was kind of, you know, when do you ever completely stop an NFL game? I mean, Never. <laughs> I mean, even the players on the field were looking up at the at the Jumbotron, you know, the, the two of them on either ends going yeah, and ch- cheering on. It was kind of neat. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that's very cool. Yeah, he's so, an American legend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For and sure. very tall. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Also swims. And very is, swims. We, 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 I, I always wondered if he had webbed feet or, you know, webbed hands, you know. He was yeah. like, <laughs> so you have a big, pretty big personality. Mm-hmm. Um, you're telling us that you do, uh, you know, some theater and different things like mm-hmm. that as well. Yeah. I do a community theater back and back home. Uh, I've been doing it since I was 16. So that's a lot of years. Let's put it like that. We won't, won't be specific. I told you earlier. I won't tell everybody. But <laughs> let's just say it's been a long time. And um started off in, in not actually high school, but with another very small theater group. And I, it, it's a, it's my hobby. I, I like doing it. I'm in a show right now. And, and um, it, it, that also lent to um, my lack of fear of public speaking because you're in front of an audience and, and you're, every time you do a show, you're, you're gauging your, your, your performance on audience reaction. Are they clapping? Are they laughing? Are they crying? You know, whatever it is that, that you're doing. And, when I give my seminars, um, I know how to play, not play an audience, but I know how to work off of people in the audience. Like if they're not really asking questions, I'll say, well, what do you think is the reason? Or, you know, this is interactive, folks. Let's let's hear yeah. some of your stories, that kind of thing. And I have no fear of public speaking whatsoever. Most people do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the number one. And then there's death. So, okay. Right. But no, no, no fear of public speaking. And doing the theater all those years. Uh, got me to the point where I'm I'm that comfortable by doing it. I think that's really important because just after talking to you a little bit about it, I feel like I wish I would have done more of that because would have been more comfortable sooner, mm-hmm. maybe talking with customers mm-hmm. and doing different things like that because I'm sure you're beyond confident when you're talking to anybody about anything because it yeah. seems like you do quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it, and the confidence is, is something that doesn't come you know immediately. You, like you mentioned, you got to work work up to it. You got to experience it. You got to learn from it and then take the next step up. So, yeah, and, and, and doing things like what you guys are doing, you know, are... are, are or some of the advantages of being able to speak to customers, talk at trade shows, you know, not be afraid to go up to people and ask a question, you know, that kind of thing. And, yeah. and that's, that's a biggie. A lot of people are terrified. They don't want, you know, they consider that confrontation and, and, and confrontation has a bad connotation to it. Right. You know, and I think people are afraid that. of getting shut down. Cause I know that is always my fear. Mm. 
you know, I can, you know, get past that. Right. I just know that that is always in the back of my mind where it's like, man, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to talk to this person. I don't care. Mm-hmm. But you always have that fear. Like, what if right. they say get lost or this and that? Right. You just move on. You know what I mean? And you right. just kind of build up that callus and just, you right. know. Because right. some of the most successful salespeople, it, it doesn't even phase them. No. You know, it's just like, no. oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's pretty normal. Yeah. <laughs> if I get one this week, like, that'll be a good week. Right, you know right, I mean? right. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. Trade shows, when I, when I give a seminar, I'll always say, you know, this is interactive. Ask questions. I don't consider them an interruption at all. You know, yell my name out, raise your hand, throw something at me, get my attention, and we'll talk. But then I say, but I can guarantee you that after I'm done and while I'm packing up, there's going to be a line of people asking, wanting to ask me a question. They're like, why didn't you ask this during the class to share that information with everybody? You know, and it's a, so it, and I can understand that. And people are hesitant about talking. And we just, at, we just, the last episode we just released was talking, and we talked quite a bit about being, you know, going to the international show or going mm-hmm. to these shows with, and try to go in with this confidence and, and with a goal, you know, to mm-hmm. learn things. And I think, you know, that's, that's the difficult thing is people don't want to ask questions and don't want to share, mm-hmm. but you know, we, we want to push that going forward because I mean, we've mm-hmm. talked to several different people that, you know, pull pro magazine, some other people that like, you know, we really want your feedback because that's how we learn and how we make it, make it better. Right. If we don't have that feedback and we don't have those questions during the classes, like I'm sure the questions they ask you privately would benefit, you know, Absolutely. everybody else in the class. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, just, you know, and it's, it's difficult though to try mm-hmm. to just ask it cause you feel like you're asking a dumb question, For sure. but you know, and you can always say, you know, no question is a dumb question, but well, it, there's it, always, that's really true, but <laughs> it is, <laughs> but, but you know, if, it, and that's right. If, if you have a class of like 200, 300 people and, and I've taught that many in one big room before that was fun, but I'm sure, you know, you're, you're terrified of raising your hand to ask this one that you might think is this is a really stupid question. I'm going to really get laughed Sit at. Sit down, that. dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, it wasn't for me. As right. my, my buddy here asked, told yeah. me to say it. I have a friend. <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. Right? That email just came in. <laughs> I, I knew it was stupid, but I just yeah. want to know what you think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got an email from a customer. He asked me this question. So Get, get out of the class. <laughs> oh, the, the worst is if somebody actually dies in your class. What? Now, I haven't had that happen. What? Not yet. Thank God. You know, knock on Way wood. to get all serious. Well, no, I, I, sorry. Yeah. I, uh, Debbie Downer here. <laughs> no, I, I, you look at it. It is kind of, it, it is sad, but it is kind of, whoa, kind of a situation. I have a, a very good friend who was my mentor, Dr. Neil Lowry, who, who's, who's, who's passed away a few years ago. And Dr. Lowry was, was teaching a um, um, seminar at the Atlantic City show. Guy got up to ask a question. And before Neil could give him the answer, he just killed all over. Had a massive coronary. was dead before he hit the floor. How do you follow something like that? Oh, <laughs> my gosh. You know, the, the, uh, and it's ha- actually, it's it's not as uncommon as you think. It has happened at, at trade shows, many trade shows over the years. You you hear the stories about, about these kind of things. Well, I was telling you, that's mm-hmm. how I feel. I don't feel healthy when <laughs> I need to say something. And I do it because I like to, I really like getting out of my comfort level mm. when I feel uncomfortable, like I feel like I need to be doing that thing right. that I'm most afraid of. Right. But anytime I raise my hand and I want to like say something and then it's like, yeah, you got a question. Like, I feel like I just start sweating. My heart is racing. Your mouth and I'm gets just, dry. You know? <laughs> like, I you, uh, where, where, where's the bathroom? <laughs> is that your question? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I was super uncomfortable. Get get yeah. aim, get the ambulance yeah. in there and yeah. do all that. So. Oh yeah, yeah. But it was it linked back to maybe the guy just. We we don't. I don't think anybody is ever is really going to know what happened, but uh, but it happened, yeah. <laughs> and and it's just one of those stories that that those of us who give seminars a lot and teach a lot, you know, have handed down over the years, kind of thing. Like like don't make your seminar so bad that somebody stands up and asks a question and dies. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Please make it light. Okay? All right. Don't do it. Yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah, not, not not that hard. <laughs> yeah. I kind of jump back into Taylor's beginnings a little bit. Sure. How um, so? What what made Doctor Taylor want to jump into water chemistry and what, and what was do you do you know what the reason Taylor became a thing basically um well his background he was a chemist okay and um he it was an industrial chemist and so he wanted to create a system that would make it easier for um uh, people who dealt with boilers and and uh, HVAC system well their equivalent of an HVAC system back then 
chillers, things like that, be able to test easier because they used to have to take samples out of the facility to a full-blown lab someplace or maybe to a college or a university to have it tested. And it, it, it was impractical. It wasn't economically feasible. So he wanted to develop a system so that the average operator could very easily do a test. And one of the first things he did was a pH test. And if you've ever looked at our website or in some of our um, historical information, there there's a um, thing called a slide comparator. And it's a long black uh, rectangle about, oh, about eight inches long, maybe a half inch thick and about three inches high. And there are ampules in there, glass ampules. And they're colored, uh, colored water in there. But every other one is a clear distilled solution. And what they would do is um, it, it's a permanent color. They never fade. We still have some of the master slides from back in the 40s and 50s that were made that we still use when we make these slide comparators, and we still do. Wow. And it's just a straight color match. So the average operator is using their eyes to match a color. And in this case, pH was so simple to do, to, to actually make and to test for, that's the one of the first tests that he did. And he mass marketed uh, this pH slide comparator. And then that was followed up by, by some other things, uh, chlorine, um, uh, orthophosphates, things that are more industrial oriented. And uh, back then he was just a local company, but when he started to develop a sales force, then the, then, the, then the name started to go out. It was called Taylor Chemical mm-hmm. back then. Mm-hmm. And um, it just started to grow and grow and grow. And then when the pool and spa industry started to really gain momentum in the late 50s, uh, he saw the opportunity to expand the company and to create uh, slide comparators back then um, for the pool and spa service people. And um, that's what he did. Um, things like phenol red, chlorine, you know, the, the, the normal stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, some stuff, you, some tests, you can't do color matching. Things like total alkalinity, calcium harness, that has to be a titration or a drop test. But the easy things, chlorine, bromine, um, gosh, I can't remember, metals testing, iron, copper, things like that. Very, very easy to do color matching. And so he expanded on that and came out with a very simple two-way test kit that did chlorine slash bromine in the same test. And pH, and then that that just took off, <laughs> like like the microphone just did. You, it took off. You have the that crazy microphone. Awesome. Like, oh, it just kind of levitated. That was an awesome transition. <laughs> but but, but um, and then uh, as the as the industry started to grow even more so in the seventies and eighties, and then all these national associations started to develop APSB, NSBI, things like that. Uh, um, by that point, Dr. Taylor had passed away. And then the people who took over the company saw the potential there. And then this expanded out all across the country. In the late 80s, we started to deal primarily through distribution. Um, so uh, we would sell to people like the SCPs of the world, the pool corps, things Leslie's. like that. Well, Leslie's is a little bit of a different situation, but the concept is still the same. We would sell to the distributors who would in turn sell to um, pool service techs, small, small pool and spa stores, things like that. And then there were also other venues for us, other Leslie's, um, but things like that. So that when I started at Taylor in, in, in 91, that's where the focus was, is through distribution, sell through distribution, and then it will trickle down. We've done a complete 180 on that. We now go, we want to seek out the homeowner, or the pool spa owner, and trickle up. You know, they do their own testing, but maybe they might want to um, get a hold of a service person to come in and do the service for them, and they test in between that kind of thing. And then the service person needs supplies. They'll go to a distributor. Distributor will go to us. But we have a, a lot of venues that we resell our product for. And that's how most reliable test kit manufacturers work, is that they have a number of different ways they can sell the product. They can do it direct. They can do it through distribution. They can do it through a large company like a Leslie's. Uh, in Florida, there's a company called Pinchapenny. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm-hmm. They're primarily in Florida, but they have started to expand a little bit um, we resell, we, we sell our products to their, their main corporation who in turn resells to the stores, to just pinch penny stores. So we have a, a lot of different venues to, to get our product out there. They're like franchises? Pinch penny is like a franchise, like a Leslie's is. So like kind of all over the place? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what, do you have any idea like what year 
it was more com- pretty much filtration systems like a pump and filter was introduced mm-hmm. because it would be you know some of the most the original swimming pools had right. no filtration right, systems right, right. so testing water you could test water but if you're not moving it you yeah. know the things you add to it aren't going to do much For, from what i understand it was around 1965 1966 is is when they started to become hey you need this as opposed to a pump and a filter being an option that kind of thing uh, and then it's just obviously grown, grown from that point. But yeah, I would say the, the mid '60s okay. is when it all when it all started to to come together in the form that we kind of know it today. Uh, obviously, today it's a little bit more advanced, but back then that's that's about when it all started. Yeah, because yeah. I know in all the research I've done, it was not common for a long time. I mean, oh, it was really uh, only only in like royalty that had pools a long time ago right first pool ever was like the great bath yeah and then it went over to like luxury hotels like back in the early 1900s right Right. and then if you had one on your property i mean you were just you know (laughs) you were just balling out of control (laughs) exactly all the money in the world (laughs) Uh you know what i mean it's like the rockefellers and the people like that that had swimming pools but i know the filtration systems no, people might think they've been around forever, but they, they no. really haven't been. No. There was some crazy, I don't know if it was real, but I saw like an old blueprint from like the like late 1800s and it almost looked like a, like a steamboat. Mm-hmm. And it was like a pool, but that's how the water was moving. It had like wooden like paddles. Paddles that moved. And it was yep. just like uh-huh. moving it. And I'm like, yep. that's just kind of cool. I'll yeah, take yeah. one of those. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. That's if way cooler than a. Uh, if you've ever cool. seen some of the pictures from like the early part of the 20th century with these enormous, like million gallon pools that you see have all these people in. Uh, I know there used to be one in Baltimore. and But again, it's just basically a hole dug in the ground, filled it with concrete, put water in it. There you go. That was it. That's all they did. I've and, seen quite a few yeah, documentaries with yeah. where they show those and yeah. then they show what they look like today because a lot of them are abandoned yeah mm-hmm. but yep. for some reason they can't totally um like demo the pool or the property yeah but they're actually kind of mm-hmm. kind of cool looking but it's yeah. it's really like kind of an eerie feeling when you see like video footage of like everybody enjoying yeah. like these swimming pools and stuff <laughs> like that and then out of nowhere yeah, you know they gone. just yeah, yeah they show the footage and it's yeah. just like weeds growing up out of the pool it's well like, they oh even used to before chlorine was became popular, which was in the 50s. Um, they used to use elemental iodine to sanitize pools. Iodine. And, and I remember a kid, my, my mother used to put iodine on a cut on a finger, but that's a different form of it. But elemental iodine is, is, is a halogen, and so is chlorine and bromines. It's all in that same column on the, um, on the element chart. But, yeah, elemental iodine back then, they would use a charcoal, activated charcoal, which is still kind of used today in some cases. Mm-hmm. Um, they, I know I've read some stories where they, they used to try to filter water through straw. Wow, straw. <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, go to the farm. Yeah, you know, get it away from the cows. And, some straw. Yeah, you know, straw. Yeah. You know. <laughs> that was must have been an interesting <laughs> process. <laughs> is uh, swimming pools like residential swimming pools and things like that? Water parks is that very big in Baltimore? Um, well, we're we're in the Mid Atlantic area, so our pool season is pretty much. Uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day, give or take a few weeks in either direction. Um, so th- there are a number of public pools, uh, a lot of residential pools, uh, more spas than anything you would you would you would because they can be used pretty much year round. Yeah. Once you start going a little bit more south, then you see that well, obviously Florida, California, Texas are the big three as far as uh, residential pools are concerned, and then then believe it or not, Pennsylvania is the next one. Go figure, Pennsylvania. You know why them? But, but is Pennsylvania where that? Um, you remember that? There's like an old school crazy water park. It was called like Action Park or something like that. You that ever, was in New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. Yeah, the the, the Death Park. Death Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Johnny I'm, Knoxville, like the Jackass crew. There, oh maybe, yeah. Or it might be already out, but they made like a full on movie of it. And I watched the documentary on Action Park, and I was like. Mm-hmm. Dude, holy crap! Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What the heck is this? People place? died when they went to this park if they did, if they didn't follow the instructions or whatnot. But yeah, dude, people was, were going through like these. Cri- dude, there had to have been going like 50, 60 miles an hour with like a forty ounce beer. Yeah, <laughs> like I mean, yeah, like you could just drink and like and like some of the yeah. cliffs they had that you could swing off. You're like, what the heck? <laughs> this is a 
Yeah. This is something you can do. Yeah. Like yeah. this is insane. Oh yeah, go to YouTube and 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 just do a search on uh, on Act Action Park and the tube uh, that went upside oh, down. Oh yeah. Oh somebody yeah. Like like oh, yeah. they said that I thought somebody like like decapitated. And, yeah. yeah, like something crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the the big water parks, um, um, the outdoor big water parks are obviously in warmer water, uh, warmer environments. Um, you do have some indoor water parks that are really, really good, uh, like up in the Wisconsin Dells area. Uh, Kalahari Resort is, is one that I know off the top of my head I've taught there. Um, the, uh, the big indoor parks um, in, that are all year long in the northern climates, uh, they have to be really careful with things like air, air circulation and fresh air exchange rates and things like that because, you know, those, uh, the, you put a sanitizer in the water in an indoor environment – and it gases off, and in case, and it doesn't have any place to gas off to fresh air. You got a problem. Right. I mean, if you've ever walked into an indoor pool, for example, and you smelled chlorine, it, don't use that pool because what you're smelling actually is the bad form of chlorine, the one that causes odors and irritations. You should chlorine really doesn't have or bromine that doesn't have a smell really, um, maybe a slight hint, but if you're you know, hitting the face with this chlorine smell, that's not a good situation. Right. Of yeah. course not. Yeah. What is usually the process? I know we're going to mostly be talking about residential, but what mm -hmm. is the process for somebody on site that takes care of maybe, you know, there's a gym we go to lifetime and there's uh -huh. a pool on site, indoor and outdoor. Right. I'm assuming there's got to be somebody that's, you know, maintaining both you inside and outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'd hope so. Yeah. <laughs> But is it usually because I know they have like quite a few lifeguards and things like that. And I know there's some where they're they kind of bounce with a lifeguard will, you know, test the water chemistry right. as well as. Right. And that's going to depend on on the state, too, because some states don't allow lifeguards to test the water or treat the water. Uh, some do. Most do. Some don't. Um, Pennsylvania, I have to bring it up again uh, because of how they classify chlorine. Um, you have to be what's called a they classify chlorine as a pesticide. Okay, not as a sanitizer. Weird. <laughs> Pennsylvania can be weird too sometimes. But um, because of that, you have to have a pesticide applicator's license to add chlorine to a pool. Huh. Okay, oh, wow. I, you can't just be a lifeguard or an aquatics manager or facilities manager and, and treat the water. You have to have a pesticide license to do that. So you got to be like a bug guy? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but, but generally speaking, yeah. Um, the, and, and the process is pretty much the same, whether whether it's a residential pool or or a commercial pool, a public pool, is that I always tell people you're going to use four of your five senses when you approach a pool, okay? The one you're not going to use is taste. Please don't taste the water, okay? Don't do that. No, 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 no. No? No, 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 no. Not, not even good. salt? No, no, well, we got a little vodka to it maybe. <laughs> but, but uh, oh, don't get me started on salt. But, but the first thing you're going to do is, is, is use your eyes. You're going to look, look, at the, look at the pool or the spa. You're going to see if there's anything blaringly wrong. Like, is the water discolored? Do you see algae? Is there any obvious galvanic corrosion going on in the ladders and the handrails? Um, you're just going to visually check it out. Okay, then you're going to smell. Do you smell something funny? Do you smell the chlorine like I just talked about? Uh, if you're smelling chlorine, then you know you've got probably combined chlorine, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, you, you're going to use your your hearing uh, because you you know uh, obviously pumps and filters have a noise to them. Okay, but if you hear the sound of an impeller <laughs> going bad, you know that's a chunk a chunk a chunk of sound. Yep. The impeller might be going up, or something's wrong with the pump, or or you don't, or you hear air hissing, or something like that. that that's a problem. And then, um, so you've got you've got sight, you've got smell, you've got um, hearing, and then finally touch. Okay, believe it or not, and it's not just simply putting your finger in the water, going, "Oh yeah, that's a pH of six or something." Like that. No, it's if, for example, say you had algae, or say you had a stain on the side that you can reach with your hand, but you don't know if that stain is metal based or if it's algae based. If you touch it and it's slippery, it's probably an algae. If you touch it and it feels the same as the surface of the pool or spa, it's probably a metal. So you're going to use four of your five senses. That, so what would you recommend? Part. Because I feel like we're running into a lot more people these days mm -hmm. that don't have a lot of those senses. <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not even trying to be funny. I mean, some people don't see very well. Mm -hmm. They have maybe no – we had a guy that left. He had like no feeling in his hands. 
Um, some people, are, a lot of people are colorblind. Oh yeah. I'm, oh yeah. I didn't know that that was like such a big thing. But oh I yeah. Mean, like your dad's colorblind. Mm-hmm. One of our guys is. I have a kind of. Oh, color. I don't know. He. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's colorblind. <laughs> we we think he might be, but <laughs> <laughs> he has to wear those sunglasses and look the color. No, but I have a kind of color colorblind myself. It's called red green. Um, that at certain shades of red and certain shades of green do a number to my eyes. Like my wife and I always have. Or always have arguments over, that's blue. No, that's purple. No, it's blue. No, it's purple. It's blue. No, it's purple. It's really purple. You know, that kind of, <laughs> but I, I see it as blue. And, and the funny thing is, if you ever go down the aisle of a, of a supermarket, the cereal aisle, and you look at a box of Captain Crunch cereal, the colors that they use in that box make it look like it's having a little mini earthquake. It's cool as crap. Okay, Kind of flashback <laughs> to the 60s for me, but that's another kind of podcast to talk about. But... <laughs> but, but uh, um, and that call, and, and a lot of people have a lot of guys have that. Mm-hmm. Women have pro- so guys have problems with looking at pinks and red. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's pretty much a chlorine test and a pH test. Right. Women have a problem with subtle shades of yellow, mm-hmm. and this is not Wayne talking or Taylor talking. This is ophthalmologic studies, op- uh, optics, uh, and color. Uh, and, and when I say that at seminars, everybody goes, "Wow, yeah, that's right. It's true." So that, for example, if I'm using one of my comparator blocks and I'm looking at the pH colors, I can tell the pH colors really, really easy. But if, if it's a color matching test for chlorine or bromine, all those pinks look the same color to me. Mm. That's why I use a different kind of test. I use a drop test for chlorine mm. that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. We'll touch sure. base on later. But, yeah, it, and, and you're right. You know, everybody has different um, um, issues when it comes to testing. Uh, but you also have to learn how to compensate for that. You know, what's, what, what are some options I can do? Like I just mentioned, you know, a drop test for corn versus color matching, uh, that I can do in order to get the right answer. You know, what, what's out there for me? There's a lot of stuff out there, but you, but you were talking about, you know, what, how, how do you approach that? And, and along with the, the four of your five sen- senses, having the right testing equipment to do what you need to do is also important. And that's whether you're, a, um, a homeowner, or whether you're a service person. If you don't have the right tools to do the job that you need to do, why do it in the first place kind of deal? And, um, you know, obviously a service person is going to have uh, not only a test kit, but other pieces of equipment to do what they need to do, brushes, you know, chemicals, things like that, or whatever it is they're doing. Um, a homeowner doesn't have that capability sometimes. You know, they, they might want to test their water, at, at the uh, at the location, they might want to take it into a store to have it tested, um, and then also have a service person come in and and do the testing for them, like an in between kind of thing. That's where things like like test strips are really handy, uh, because test strips are, are quick and simple. Am I where I need to be? Kind of kind of kind of test. But if it goes beyond the ranges where you need to be, then you need to know you need to do something else. Yeah. And whether that's something else is taking a sample to a store or having a service person come in and test the water. Um, uh, as long as they have something that they can do to, to test the water to make sure it's safe. Because that's the two things. You, you, the two things, anytime you, you want to, whenever anybody asks me, why do we test water? There's two things. We want to make it safe for the users, safe and healthy. Okay, they, You don't want them getting sick. Okay, And you want to make sure the equipment's functioning properly so that they don't get sick. Right. You know, is the filtration system working? Do you have the right turnover rates? Uh, is the is the sanitizer being applied properly? Whatever the sanitizer is, so those are two big two big important things. You know, uh, protection of people and protection of equipment. Most definitely. And who exactly uses Taylor kits? I mean, I saw a blog about you know um, the water shapers using it, mm-hmm. and obviously tons of others. Uh-huh. Um, is there any kind of you know key players out there? You know. And, well, I'm, I, I, I would say that our, our, our biggest audience, audience, our biggest customer base is, is through service. Um, uh, whether it's a, you know, out on the West Coast over my, it, it doesn't matter. Service is probably it. Then, then you have, I would think, all of the people who operate uh, the public and semi-public facilities, things like condos, hotels, uh, the water park people, things like that. Um, they would be the next big users. Uh, then you would have the smaller individually uh, privately owned pools um, but are get are still open to the public these are called semi-public um, I think I mentioned condos they're called semi-public pools 
Um, and then you would have your average homeowner pool of, of whatever size. So we kind of cover all the bases. I mean, we've done, geez, um, the, the Olympic, some of the Olympic pools, especially when it was in Atlanta um, back, back whenever. Um, 96. 96, yeah. Um, we have a lot of natatoriums at universities, colleges across the country, and Canada too. So pretty much wherever there's a pool, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, knock on wood, you're going to see a tailor kit there. Okay. Or, or, or not. You know, not even if it's a tailor kit, which we, of course, we would prefer it would be. But as long as they have something to test the water, you know, something is better than nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> you're close. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and and then take it the next step if you need to. Right. Thank you guys so much for listening so far. We truly appreciate your time in your ear. We know that you are busy and we appreciate you spending time with us. I just want to mention a few things here before we jump right back in with Wayne and discuss a lot of the tailor kits and how to use them and things like that. We, one, started a Facebook group and it's been pretty awesome so far. There's a lot of positive interaction in there, a lot of learning. So if you're interested in that, please you know, join, fill out a couple of questions for us. Let us know you're going to be positive and we'll let you in. So if you want to be part of the pool chasers community there, please do so. Also, if you have not picked up your pool chaser swag yet, please go to the website, fill out the feedback form and we'll get you some pool chasers gear. Last but not least, the pool chasers mixer, which I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, just wanted to throw it back in here one more time. You know, it is selling out fast, so please get your tickets as soon as possible. And, you know, we're so excited for that. We're so excited to hang out with you guys to build the community and to spend time with one another and growing and learning and just having a great time. So please jump on that. Go to the website, poolchasers.com, click events, and you'll follow the process through there. So we appreciate you guys once again. Thank you. And we'll jump right back into it after a word from our sponsor. What's going on, everybody? This episode is brought to you by Jobber. Jobber is by far our favorite tool for collecting deposits, payments, scheduling customer jobs, and assigning tasks to a specific person on our team. If you're looking for a better way to stay organized, this is it. I don't even know how we did things before Jobber. If you have any questions, their customer service team is out of this world. Jobber is so cool that they are hooking up all of our listeners with a free 14-day trial. Just visit getjobber.com backslash pool chasers. That's getjobber.com backslash pool chasers. Try it out. We promise you won't be disappointed. You think you can go over just what the tailor kit is and the type okay. of, you know, okay. what the reagent is and, mm -hmm. you know, just what all that is and how you should size it up for what you're doing? How, what tailor kit should you be choosing for sure. the type of work that you're doing? Sure. Well, in, in addition to making what we call single parameter kits uh, for like, there's just one kit for phosphate, one kit for sodium chloride, you know, that kind of thing. The, the, the probably the most popular kit that we have is our uh, complete kit. And what the complete kit is, it contains 13 reagents. And those reagents will test for chlorine or bromine. Uh, the basic sanitizers are the most popular ones. Uh, pH, total alkalinity, calcium hardness, not total hardness now, but calcium hardness, that's an important difference, and cyanuric acid. And then we make variations of that kit. If, for example, if you were dealing with a bromine situation, of course, we're not going to have some of the reagents in there because you're not going to use the same reagents. And bromine doesn't work with cyanuric acid or vice versa, so we don't have the cyanuric acid reagents in there. So we have variations on that. And then that particular kit comes in two different sizes. So depending upon the number of tests that you do would define which size bottle you would get. Um, the average uh, test kit gets about, oh, about 140 pH tests and about, and about the same number of chlorine or bromine tests out of it. And when you go up to the next size bottle, you get a little bit more than double that. So depending upon what you're, what you're doing during the week and whether you can refill the reagents with larger sizes, which is a big, which is a big thing too because you want to save a couple pennies here and there, you can take a gallon of a reagent and pour it back into the bottle. Uh, and, and the gallon, obviously, per test is going to be cheaper than it would be if you're buying just the smaller bottles yourself. But with, those, with that basic test, you've hit just about everything you would need for basic information on, on the water. And a lot of it has to do with water balance. We, we talked a little bit about that earlier. And, and water balance is, is five parameters in your water. pH, alkalinity, calcium hardness, temperature, and TDS. All thrown together 
into a formula, and the resulting number tells you whether your water's um, scale forming, whether it's corrosive, or whether it's that sweet spot right in between where it's neither. And that has a lot to do with equipment, obviously. You know, one of the two things that I talked about earlier, uh, comfort for users and equipment. So we, we have everything there your average service person would need. Now, of course, we make all the other individual tests, like I mentioned. Uh, we talked a little bit about salt systems, chlorine generator systems. We make a salt test kit. Uh, we make a, a, a salt version of our complete kit that has salt reagents in it. Um, phosphates are a big thing now. Phosphates and nitrates, we have a phosphate kit. Um, so we pretty much have a kit for anything, <laughs> it seems. Yeah, and for as far as the like the drops go with the reagents, what's that style of testing? Is that DPD testing? Right. Um, and back in the back in the olden days, <laughs> um, there was no such thing as DPD. All it was 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 OT orthotolony, OTO, OT, whatever you want to abbreviate. It. And that was the yellow color, and uh, orthotolony only measures total chlorine. And uh, there are certain components to chlorine. You have total chlorine, which is the, the um, uh, amount of free chlorine in your water and combined chlorine. A free chlorine is your active sanitizer and oxidizer. That's the kind of chlorine that's doing the job it's supposed to do. I call it the good cop. Okay? <laughs> then the bad cop comes in, and that's combined chlorine. After free chlorine has done the job it's supposed to do, sanitizing and oxidizing, it forms combined chlorine. And that's the typical smell that you would, that you would associate chlorine with. Or, or irritation to your eyes or skin or something like that. If you take the value of your free chlorine reading and your combined chlorine reading, add them together, that's your total chlorine. So with orthotolidine, when you're doing a total chlorine test, you don't know how much is free chlorine. You don't know how much is combined chlorine. It's just a total chlorine test. We still make orthotolidine test kits wow. because homeowners, um, I'm not saying they don't care, but they don't really need to know necessarily the difference between free chlorine and combined chlorine. All they want to know is they got chlorine. Mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is you can't use orthotolidine uh, in any kind of public facility because orthotolidine is considered a possible carcinogenic substance. And health officials don't like that. Right. So it's banned in, in, in the use of any kind of public facility, orthotolidine. That's why DPD came in. DPD, which is the pink color allows you to test your free chlorine reading and your combined chlorine reading separately. Yeah. So if you're doing a color matching test for chlorine, like most kits are, okay, doing your free chlorine test first and you're getting an answer, then you're adding a certain number of drops of another reagent to that same treated sample. And if there's a change in color, that means you have total chlorine. And then you just subtract your free reading from your total to get your combined. Now, ideally, you don't want that color to change. You want it to stay the same. You want a zero combined chlorine, okay? If you've got combined chlorine, you've got to get rid of it and get rid of it by doing something called breakpoint chlorination. But I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit. But, but with, with the, the big thing is, is orthotolidine does total chlorine, uh, yellow color. DPD does free and combined chlorine, pink color. And it's the pink and the one, uh, the, the DPD method is the one that should be used by service professionals, okay, and, and, and health officials too, they're, they're going to go out and test because they want to know what that free chlorine reading is. They want to know what the good cop is. Sure. Yeah. So what is the most common kit for, you know, basic residential pools, maybe say here in Phoenix? Mm -hmm. um, what's the most, and I know you guys have like, uh, like the K2005 and different things right, like that. Right, and that's, that's the complete kit, the K2005. We have um, simple uh, two-way test kits. And four-way test kits for, for homeowners, um, the the uh, short track series they're called, um, and the two-way kit is a, a, a bottle of uh, reagent um, number one, DPD number one and number two, and then a bottle of phenol red. So you're doing a sanitizer test and you're doing a pH test, and that's what most homeowners are concerned about. What's the what's the what's the chlorine level or bromine level? What's the pH level? And they leave it at that. And they leave it up to a, a service person if they have a contract to come in and do the rest of the testing, how often they ever do it. And what, what are the ingredients in these reagents? I mean, how is it being able to 
give us some type okay. of reading. Shh, that's a secret. I can't tell you. <laughs> the secret sauce. <laughs> the secret, the secret <laughs> sauce. Yeah. No, uh, actually, it, it, and I kid about it, but it is proprietary information. Sure. But uh, the, the chemistry behind it is public information. And we all, all of the reagents that we use, I would say most of the reagents that we use in our kits, except for the, the, the private ones, are, are out of something called Standard Methods for the Examination of Water and Wastewater. And this is a publication that the American Public Health Association puts out every so often. Um, the one that I have is the 20th edition, which is 1998, I think. Uh, all of the recipes on how to do the chemistries behind all of these tests are right in that, right in that uh, standard methods. And that, that's our Bible. That, that's the chemist's Bible. So, so um, some of the proprietary tests, like the DPD, uh, that's you know super secret sauce kind of thing. Sure. <laughs> um, and everybody, and all, all of us test kit manufacturers have our own proprietary information. So um, can't tell you yeah, of course. It, what it does, but I can just tell you that it's there. <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to make sure to ask. <laughs> so what, uh, um, if people don't know, what exactly is a reagent? A reagent is, and it's not a regent, which people will say that, but it's called a reagent, R-E-A-G-E-N-T, is a bottle of liquid um, something uh, that will test something. It can be uh, a, a phenol red reagent that will test uh, for pH. It can be uh, the reagents that you use for total alkalinity test, and you need three. Uh, could be for testing calcium hardness, cyanuric acid. Uh, but it's 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 you it's a liquid, ninety nine point nine percent of the time that you add to a sample of water that will do something to that water, whether it will change the water to a color where you can match it, or change it to a color that will start a process that you're going from one color to another or uh, uh, add something to the water that will cause the right colors to develop. Uh, there are reagents that are powder-based. Uh, those would be some of the indicator solutions when you're doing a drop test for chlorine, for example, where you're scooping out a small amount of powder, you're adding it to a sample of water, and it does something to the water, usually changes color. But a reagent is, it, that, that's what a reagent is. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about how you should actually be storing this stuff. Um, cause I had an issue with this and I want to make sure everybody else knows how, um, what does storage look like for these units? Sure. Storage conditions is, is, is 99% shelf life. Um, every, and let me start off with the shelf life issue. Every reagent that we manufacture on the label has an expiration date on it or used by date on it and a lot number. The lot number tells me, tells Taylor, when that thing was bottled, okay? Um, the expiration date is the average expiration date for that reagent, which is generally two years for most reagents, assuming common sense storage conditions. What's common sense storage conditions? Out of direct sunlight, okay? And a relatively ambient temperature between 35 and 85 degrees. Do you, uh, know, where, do you know where you're at? Yeah, yeah I know where I'm at. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. That's not going to work. Between 35 and 85 degrees, Caps on tight, that kind of thing. Common sense. Keep out of reach of children, that kind of thing. Common sense storage conditions. Now, yeah, we're in Phoenix, and it's hot. Um, what, 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 how does that affect shelf life? Well, it, it won't automatically make the reagent go bad. It will just shorten the shelf life. Okay, But most of the time, a, a service person is going to use up those reagents by the time anything would go bad. Most of the time. Uh, reagents could be contaminated. Uh, if they're touched to like a surface or something like that, should never touch the tip of a reagent. Um, I know some people who keep their reagents and their test kits in a refrigerator overnight, like here in this area, you know, uh, Southern California. Th that's nice, uh, but they're not batteries. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you and know, it has a, it kind of has an odor to it too. I mean, it, it can, yeah, it can. But but the thing is, it you know, heat is probably the number one thing. Uh, that's going to really mess up a reagent. And and there are certain things that you can look for when you know, when you think a reagent is going bad. For example, a clear reagent, if it's starting to look cloudy or there's little chunks of things floating inside of it, you no, know, get rid of it. It's not good. It should be just that clear. Um, if it's a powder, it should not be changing color. Uh, the DPD indicator powder uh, is normally a white or a slightly off-white kind of, kind of color, but you can go bad by 
uh, getting getting exposed to humidity, it starts getting little black flecks in it, starting to oxidize out. And once that happens, it's not good either. Um, all of the other reagents that are colored, the best way that you can tell they're going bad is if you start seeing layers of color build up inside the bottle. Like, for example, the phenol red reagent is kind of a blood ready kind of color. If you start seeing layers of yellow and start seeing layers of green in it, that means it's like almost probably been stuck in a microwave kind of deal. The dyes are breaking down, okay, and, and they're not good. But these reagents are pretty hardy for the most part. Any reagent, the, the important one though is any reagent in a brown bottle. So we're talking uh, DPD number two, silver nitrate, a couple other reagents. Um, they're in a brown bottle for a reason, and, and any reagent from any manufacturer that's in a brown bottle, that means it's an oxidizer, which means that once it's exposed to air, heat, and light for any length of time, uh, longer than what you're using for, for the test, it's going to start to go bad. That's why we say cap immediately after use. For example, the DPD number two reagent in a brown bottle comes out of the bottle clear. You probably have all seen that, right? But if it comes out of the bottle pink or red, it's no good. It's oxidized out. That means it's been uncapped or something like that. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into stores that have labs, okay, testing labs in them. It doesn't matter whose lab it is, but every single cap is off of every single reagent. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah, they'll open them up in the morning, they'll stick it off to the side, they'll put them back on at the end of the day. You know, but you don't know whether you're putting the right cap back on the right bottle, number one, uh, and that could cross-contaminate the reagents. But the reagents themselves are exposed to air, heat, and light. Even though you're inside, it's still there. So they're going to be bad. So what's going to happen? You're going to get a false reading? You're going to get a false reading or an odd color. Uh, more than likely, it's going to be a false reading. Um, or you're going to get some kind of a, of, a, of a value that you know isn't right. For example, chlorine. Okay, If you're doing a chlorine test and you're doing a color match test for chlorine, and you know there's chlorine in that sample, you... You know, swear four paychecks. There's chlorine in that sample. But you're adding your, your reagents, no color develops. What's going on? Okay? That's, a, that's an interference. Okay? And that usually means you probably have really too much chlorine in the water. It's bleaching it out. Mm -hmm. You probably heard the terms bleaching or maybe partial bleaching. That's that kind of situation. Uh, a pH test. Okay? If you add your, your phenol red reagent to a pH test... And, and the other thing to remember, too, is phenol red only measures pH between 6.8 and 8.4. That's it. That's all it's designed to. So if you have a pH reading that's higher than 8.4 or lower than 6.8, you're going to get that bottom color or top color. That's it. You don't know. Okay? And also, if, if there's a high chlorine reading, your pH is going to go purple instead of red. And I'm sure you've seen that at, at some point. Uh -huh. So there, there's a lot of things that can happen, okay? A lot, of, a lot of little signals that you can see that a reagent is going bad. But again, with, with, especially in an area where, where the pool season is pretty much year-round, uh, the, the, the odds of that happening, because you're turning over so many, you're using so many reagents during that time period, that likelihood is, is not, not high. So do you think it would be best in places like Scottsdale Phoenix mm -hmm. to bring in the test kits into a normal air conditioned environment at the yeah. end of every day at the end of the day. Yeah. 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 And, and if you're using a van or a truck, that's not air conditioned, God forbid. Um, I know people who will keep their reagents and their, their test kits and like, like a little cooler with one of those freezy gel packy things. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're keeping them cool. You're keeping them away from the heat. Right. Yeah. I would guess common practice is that you keep it in your tote out all day with you so i mean you know as far as out it's mm -hmm. going to be outside in the back of a truck right. most of the day so you know if that's exposing it to our yeah. extreme temperatures <laughs> right yeah but i mean if you bring it inside at the end of the day into air conditioning yeah. i think it might you know yeah. prolong the life of those it will help it yes absolutely yeah so also do you recommend maybe then in climates that don't have pools year round to kind of get a new test kit every season yeah if you do your inventory right yeah uh, getting a new test kit every every pool season is probably not a bad idea yeah and is there a good practice for rinsing out um you know just the water test yeah um well uh, uh, rinsing out you actually do that in two situations the first one is if you were pouring from a larger bottle reagent like a repour you're, you're taking like a gallon of something and putting it in a small bottle you're saving money 
you should always rinse out the bottle, the cap, and the tip with distilled water and let it air dry before you add it. Because what if a little bit of leftover reagent is contaminated and you just poured a new reagent, you've now contaminated everything. Okay? So always rinse it out with distilled water. When you go to do a test poolside or you're bringing it in, in, in to, to a store, you should always rinse out your test cells or your comparator blocks or whatever it is you're using at least three times, uh, ideally with distilled water. Um, if you don't have that handy, and you can get that at any supermarket, um, tap water is fine. But remember that Taffley tap water has a little bit of chlorine in it, mm-hmm. some other things going on in it that, that might cause a weird answer or a strange reaction. But distilled water is usually the best. Is that because it's got a more balance to it? Uh, it's it's more pH neutral. doesn't have all the contaminants that tap water has in it. Because tap water varies. Oh, absolutely. From, oh, God, all over the place. All, yeah. I mean, you can't even say city to city. I mean, it's just yeah, my it's neighbor like could have to block. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. different water than me. Is there a time limit on, say, I take water from a customer's pool to, you know, bringing it back to the shop or just somewhere yeah. to be tested? Yeah. Is there kind of a time frame there where the water starts to kind of get a little kind of weird and the chemistry changes? Yeah, uh, and, and kind of weird is probably the best way to describe it. <laughs> uh, I, I've had callers over the years that, you know, they say they'll, they'll take a sample and they'll stick it in the trunk of their car in the morning and then at 4 o'clock, oh, yeah, I should take this to the store and, and you know, pull spots and have it tested. No, there's no way. <laughs> Anything's going to be right. We usually recommend that when you take a sample, get it to the store within 45 minutes to an hour. Wow. Okay. Or less. Okay. Ideally, too, the kind of container is important because I see a lot of these sample bottles that are translucent. They're not good because sunlight can get through them. Okay. The best thing would be an, an opaque bottle. You know, a, a doesn't matter what color as long as it's a solid color so that the sunlight can't get through it. Okay. But but that that end within about forty five minutes to an hour. Like, well, what what's going to happen if you you know you're holding on to a bottle of water for the day? I mean, it's just back to well, not well, well first reading. of all, you're not going to get any kind of sanitizer reading because because chlorine or bromine are going to go right away, pretty pretty quickly. Okay, remember one part per million of chlorine dissipates in direct sunlight and pool water in about fifteen minutes, wow. without a, without the benefit of any help. That's pretty quick. Okay, yeah, and the hotter the water it is, the quicker that degradation happens. Particularly if it's chlorine, bromine's a little bit more hardy with with hot water, but if it's chlorine, it's going to go away. So if you, if you wait all day to take it to the store, they're going to say, "Oh, you don't have any chlorine here. Add add ten pounds of Cal Hypo in it," and where you really didn't need to add ten pounds of Cal Hypo because there was already chlorine in there. That kind of thing. Yeah. pH can be affected too. Because of the heat of the water. The hotter the water, the more pH has a tendency to rise a little bit. So you got to be careful of that. Alkalinity is not affected that much. Uh, hardness is not affected that much. But the two biggies, uh, sanitizer and pH, big time. Right. Yeah. You think I'd get in trouble if I put a siren on top of my car? <laughs> Because I had to rush the water to back to the. To you you might it. have a visit by by your local law enforcement people. Uh, you know, there's laws Excuse against. Me, that. Why are you doing sixty in a you know in a thirty? I my pool water sample to the store. I have forty five minutes, and this is a busy road. I gotta get gotta get this water tested. That's right. Here's Wayne's number. That's right. Call me. I'll say who. I don't know that person. No, he's crazy. I never said to do that. <laughs> um, That's funny. So this is all good stuff. I'm trying to think of the things that we mm-hmm. deal with, you know what I mean? Because I think it's really important, especially where we're at here in Arizona, mm-hmm. where we deal with such oh, yeah. crazy weather. I mean, we have the monsoons. Mm-hmm. We have up to 115. We had somewhat 118, 120 yeah. degrees oh, yeah. out here. Yeah. So it gets extremely hot. So yeah. you have to pay close attention to, to yeah. everything. Yeah. And I noticed seeing the tailor kits in a lot of um, pool technicians' vehicles and even some of ours, and we had to really take care of it was that you know not really taking care of it i mean it's got to be latched you know caps not being on there all the way and it's yeah. you have to take that serious because if you're running into a situation where you're like the water is very clear but the chemistry is just not lining up yeah. it's like no the water chemistry is probably just yeah. fine it's yeah. you know what i mean it's the reagents yeah. are damaged yeah. or something's contaminated or you're not because, I mean, you have to be elbow deep usually. Yeah, to... you, you go down. Uh, the, the general recommendation is you go down 18 inches below the surface, which is generally that bend in your elbow. 
and away from return lines too. Away from okay. return, okay. Okay, for obvious reasons. Um, and then, uh, for example, what you would do is if you had a had a comparator block or a test cell, you would turn it upside down in the water, eighteen inches, and then turn it right side up and bring it up. That's the correct technique. You should never skim off the surface of the water or dip the test strip in the first few inches of water because sunlight can penetrate four to six inches into the surface, and you're going to get weird answers. You're going to get weird results. The best is a little bit deeper, 18 inches. Okay. So you and have why, a test strip going down that far, you recommend? Well, what, I mean, what, how, how would you get that far without touching You collect it? a sample or, or a container, plastic container now, not a class, Okay, collect it 18 inches and then dip the test strip okay. in that. And, in fact, some of our test strips, we include a little, uh, we, a little test tube, plastic test tube to oh, do okay. that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And why, why should it be away from the returns? Well, with the return line, remember, that depending upon what system you have, you could be feeding a fairly concentrated amount of chemical into that return line to go back and disperse in the pool, whether it's a chemical a chlorine feed system, um, uh, you're feeding acid, things like that. So if you take it right in front of the return line, you're going to get a, a false high answer or a false answer, period, because of the concentration right there. You want to keep it away from return, at least a couple of foot or two away, and then take that sample because that by that time, hopefully, uh, all the product has been has been mixed through. Sure, yeah. that definitely makes sense. Yeah, um, I've known people who've gone out on swimming pool uh, on diving boards and taken buckets and and like laid down, you know, stomach down on the diving board and picked up water and, and brought it that way. Yeah, that's a little bit of an overkill situation. I was gonna say, but, even you when you see that, you're like, it's it's <laughs> that, it's not <laughs> that serious. Do you have? Is there a real big issue here? <laughs> it's like, thank you, but you might want to try something different. Stop <laughs> showing off. I don't do that every week. <laughs> um, so let me just ask you this. This is just, you know, from step one, say you're a new pool mm-hmm. service um, and you need to start doing water chemistry and you okay. choose the tailor kit. Right. Which tailor kit would you use just starting off? Say you're only doing a few pools. Which tailor kit would you use and what exactly mm-hmm. would you be testing for? And okay. what should you be, what data should you be collecting? Right, right. Um, the kit that I mentioned earlier, the complete kit, the K2005, is probably going to be the best, best starting point okay. right, for, for, a brand, uh, for a newbie, okay, a new service person. And uh, assuming the, the customer, let's make it easy, the customer's on chlorine, okay, what should this person be doing? Well, I always, I always tell people when, when, when they're testing, read the stupid instructions. Not, not stupid, but, but read them, stupid. <laughs> uh, they're there for a reason. Okay, because not everybody's instructions are the same. They're a little bit different. But read the instructions first. And the first test they're probably going to be doing is the, the, set, the chlorine and a pH test because the comparator block does both uh, at, at the same time. So they'll go in, they'll, they'll collect their sample, they'll go down 18 inches away from a return line and collect their sample. And then they'll and you I, shake it off. You do the wrist shake. It, 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 it's called flicking. I'm really good at flicking after 28 <laughs> years. Let me tell you. Um, yeah, if, if you can flick real good, it's, it's yeah. good. Yeah, because there's that water line you need to have it. Yeah, written right. Over. And and it's and the instructions clearly tell you where where to line it up to. Okay. And then again, just follow the instructions. Like for a chlorine test, your basic chlorine test, you got your sample of water, and you add five drops of DPD number one, and then five drops of DPD number two. Get off on a tangent slightly. I have a lot of people tell me, well, I only use DPD number two when I do the test. Well, why? Because the instructions are telling you to use both. You really need to use both. People say, well, what's the use of having DPD number one? It doesn't do anything. DPD number one is a clear reagent, and it's a buffer. And what a buffer does is that it actually changes the pH of the water so that when you add that DPD number two, you get that right pink color to match to one of the standards on the block. If you don't use the buffer, you might get a pink color. You might not. And even if you do get a pink color, it's probably going to be wrong because the sample's pH is incorrect. So you've got to follow the instructions for, for that reason. So then, so they've added their two reagents. They cap it, and they invert it a couple times. You never shake your sample. Never. The only test in that kit that we tell people to actually agitate is a cyanuric acid test. Everything else is cap and invert a couple times. It's liquid to liquid. It's going to mix instantly. And then when they go to match the color, and this is really important, okay? Assuming you're outside, best possible scenario, 
you want to hold the comparator blocked up um, eye level and parallel to the ground. You don't want to tilt it or twist it or anything like that. And then you want to face away from the sun. You want the sun to hit you on your back or on your shoulders. Because if you're facing the sun, the sun's going to alter how your eyes interpret that color. Now, if it's a cloudy day, which I think they do have in Phoenix every now and then. If mm, it's a, I've never seen a single <laughs> cloud here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a cloudy day that's even better because sometimes the blue of the sky can really mess up people's eyes. Okay. Okay. So if that happens, take a piece of white piece, a white a piece of paper or a friend with a white T-shirt and just have them stand about a foot behind it and then match the color that way. Um, so then they match their colors uh, and, they, and they, get a, they get a value. And then they're going to do a combined chlorine test. So they're going to take that same sample. They're not going to dump it. They're going to add five drops of DPD number three. Now, hopefully you don't want any kind of color change. Because if you don't have a color change, that's great. That's what you want. That means you have no combined chlorine. If it gets darker, you do have total chlorine. Okay, you do have combined chlorine. So you just take the difference, the mathematical difference between your free reading and your total reading to get your combined reading. The pH test is the same way. It's five drops of phenol red, um, phenol red reagents. Uh, and then it produces that yellow to dark red kind of color, depending upon what the pH uh, value is. Uh, ideally, you want to be between 7.4 and 7.6. So the 7.5 color is kind of like a peachy kind of color. Uh, and that's what you're trying to shoot for as best you can. And then after that, what tests need to be done kind of depends on the customer and what you know, what you've contracted to test for, things like that. Ideally, you should be doing a total alkalinity test once a week, maybe once every 10 days. You can probably get away with it unless there's been a weather event or a big party, that kind of thing. Uh, hardness once a month, once every six weeks is fine. Cyanuric acid, um, probably once a month is probably not a bad idea. You don't need to test it all the time. Okay. So then you have all these values in front of you. What do you do with them? Okay. Well, you look at them. If, if, if the readings are within the ranges where you want to be, great, you're fine. Go to the next pool. But if uh, one of the ranges is out, you may need to add some acid to lower the pH. You may need to add some bicarb to raise your alkalinity. You may need to add some chlorine, you know, that kind of thing. You do your adjustments that way. Um, we talked about water balance a little bit earlier. You have an alkalinity reading, you have a pH reading, and you have a hardness reading. That's three components of water balance. The next two you need is temperature and TDS. Temperature is, is simple. You know, look at the thermometer. You know, what's the temperature? TDS is a bit of a different nut because a lot of people don't understand TDS, total dissolved solids. And basically what that is, is everything we've added to the pool over the course of its history. Sanitizers, oxidizers, people, dogs, <laughs> you know, all these other treatment products. They all have inert materials to them. Okay, which build up over time. They don't go away. They're not filtered out. Normally, you don't see them because they're dissolved, total dissolved solids. But after a certain point, um, things start to happen. And you know that your TDS level is too high by things like chemical reactions occur too slowly. Or the water has maybe a little bit of a cloudiness to it that you, that you can't explain by any other, other reading. Um, or the water's been in the pool for more than 10 to 15 years. That's the kicker, because TDS builds up to the point where it can affect overall water balance. Normally, you don't want your TDS level to be more than 1,500 parts per million from your incoming. All water has TDS, okay? So, for example, in the Baltimore area where I'm from, TDS out of our tap is about four to 500 parts per million on an average, okay? Pretty, pretty low. There's lower amounts across the country, but that's about right for, for that part of the country, which means I can go up to about 1,900, 2,000 parts per million TDS, not have to worry about it. That takes a long time to happen. It's not a weekly or a monthly thing. We're talking years, okay? But when you, when you apply that as part as water balance, it has a small um, effect on overall water balance, but it is still part of water balance. And in that K2005 kit, that I was talking about before, it contains the ability to figure out water balance. And the little wheel that you, it's called a water gram. It's like a, it's literally, it's a, it's a circular slide rule. And it will help you figure out whether your water's 
leaning towards being corrosive, leaning towards being scale forming, or right in that little sweet spot of being perfectly in balance. So the, 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 the tech has all the tools there to do the job they need to do. If they need to do some other tests, then, then so be it. They have another test, like chlorine generators. They need to test for salt. Or at least verify what the what the online um, or inline reading is on their on their um, on their um, um, display unit. Um, we have those kind of tests again, simple drop tests. And a drop test, if I can step back a little, a drop test is different than color matching. A drop test is what we call a weighted measurement. In other words, you're adding something to something to create something. So you're adding a reagent to create a color, and then you're adding another reagent to go from one color to another color. In alkalinity, in total alkalinity, is called an acid-based titration. So what you do is you get your sample of water, whatever the test tells happens to be, Taylor's, it's 25 mils, and then you add a couple drops of uh, thiosulfate, which is a chlorine neutralizer. You've got to get rid of the chlorine in there because uh, it causes, high chlorine causes an interference. Then you add your indicator, and it goes a green, a really nice pretty green. And then you add a very weak form of sulfuric acid drop by drop until it goes from green to what I always call a candy apple red kind of color. And the number of drops it takes to do that color change times 10 is your alkalinity test. Pretty simple. Okay? You don't have to worry about trying to match colors with your eyes. You can blatantly see green to red. Okay? Calcium hardness test is the same way. You go from uh, a red color to a really pretty sky blue color and multiply the number of drops by the drop equivalents, and that's your hardness reading. So, Thank you. It's, it's, it's not rocket science here, guys, although some people will claim it is. <laughs> but I think, you know, one thing that isn't discussed as much as, you know, we'd probably want to hear is how do you truly master, like, just water, <laughs> clear, safe water, mm -hmm. and that's making sure you know how many gallons the pool is, mm -hmm. how long the pool is running, what you know turnover the, rates really important exactly because yeah. i mean none of that stuff is really going to matter right. you know i mean you're not it's like man why is the chlorine always right. so low or why is this and it's like it's running three right. hours a day right it's 115 degrees outside <laughs> you know what i mean and i know we get pushback from customers where mm -hmm. their pool's running only you know maybe four or five hours yeah i know They're like it stays you know it stays clear and it's like maybe Barely. for a second <laughs> nobody's yeah, using you're lucky it. yeah you know yeah. what i mean um, but I mean, those are all things that mm -hmm. you teach as well as like, it's, it's crucial to know, you know, measure the pool out and oh, do sure. all that initial, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, mathematics behind it, because if you don't know any of that, it's, no. it's going to be difficult to gauge what you need to do. And that's why some things like the, the CPO course and some of the other courses that are out there that, that you can get at trade shows or other places, Genesis system, uh, people have some really good courses too. That's why you take those kind of courses to learn how to do that. The first thing you do in a CPO course is that you teach them how to calculate the number of gallons in a pool. You know, you can probably figure out what it is if you're if you've been in what round a while and you know how you know the size of it and things like that. But you need to know exactly how many gallons of water are in that pool in order to be able to dose it and treat it properly. Because more is not a good thing when you're talking pool chemical treatment. You know, everybody thinks that more is better. Uh uh, no, it's not. It's it be more damaging than anything else more or less is not <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're, they're both not so uh -huh. great. <laughs> but in, well we were talking about you know ppm early what's a ppm everybody says you know you measure this in parts per mo what the hell's a ppm and the best way to visualize that is you have a pool and you throw in a million ping pong balls okay you take out four of them okay that's four parts per million that's what a, a, a pretty good chlorine reading should be okay so you have 999,990 whatever left, 96 left. Okay, but that's just, that's a good visual when you're talking to people about what a part per million is. Mm -hmm. Now, you throw a you know, monkey into this wrench, you talk about phosphates. That's measured in parts per billion. Okay, per billion. So you had a billion pig pong balls in there and you pull out some. But uh, phosphate is, is the only one that's kind of measured weirdly. Um, it, it's in parts per million, uh, parts per billion. You can measure it in parts per million, but most of the tests that are out there measure it in parts per billion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what's a recommended turnover rate you would suggest? Well, let's talk commercial pools first, okay? Um, six to eight hours is the nationally recognized turnover rate, okay, um, to get proper filtration. But For commercial? 
for a commercial pool, six to eight hours. That that that's how long it takes for all the water in the pool to go through the system one, one time. time. Oh, okay. okay, to get complete and effective filtration, you need to have that go through probably four times. Okay, so four six-hour turnovers. Anything faster than six or slower than eight, you're not getting effective filtration. So it's running 24 hours a day. 24-7. Now, you've got homeowner pools, you know, variable speed, variable speed pumps and all, all the stuff that's out there now. Um, I, I'm also a big proponent of if it's not fixed, don't, if not broke, don't fix it kind of deal. If, if you've got a customer who runs their, their, their system four or five hours a day and their pool is fine, you know, the pool looks great, the chemistry is fine, far be it for me to, to screw something up. They're really lucky. But to get effective filtration properly, that pump should be that that pool should be going twenty four seven. Yeah, yeah. But there's costs involved with that too. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's it's kind of funny. I never really thought about it much until now. But being like so energy efficient, mm-hmm. it's funny being energy and cost efficient with a swimming pool. Yeah. Like you're like draining pool and you're dealing with water and it's, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like people in California yep. you know what I mean? <laughs> being in the drought and stuff yeah. like that. It's well, yeah. The, and that, that was a problem um, for a long time. Well, a couple times actually over the years is that they couldn't um, drain their pools or spas at all. Period. The only people who could would be new builds that were built before a certain date. They could fill, fill you know, use, use the water to fill up the pool. But for the longest time, they couldn't do anything. Now, the drought's not as bad now as it was. Um, you can drain and refill in most areas in California. But, yeah, they still do run. And it's not just California. It's a lot of other places, too. What do you think about reverse osmosis? Um, I like it. Uh, it's got its place. It can be pricey. Um, I like RO systems on well water sources uh, more than municipal systems. Um, I, it will help with uh, metals. And with hardness and things of that nature. But, yeah, I, I do like the RO systems. Yeah, it's a good substitute. I mean, if you can't drain a pool or right. do something yeah. and there's no you know sewer clean out or mm-hmm. something, um, that's a heck of a lot better yeah. than doing nothing at all. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In addition to the, 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 the test kits that we're more, more known for, the, the liquid reagent test kits, uh, we do make a series of test strips, uh, a four-way test strip, a six-way test strip. Um, uh, we also um, have a test strip for salt. Uh, we're coming out with one for borates and one for phosphates fairly soon. So uh, w- with test strips, and we kind of touched base on this a little bit earlier, yeah, the test strips are more designed, are really, really designed for homeowners and pool owners. Although I know why service people use them, okay? They're, they're more designed for, for your average Joe. Um, who has a pool who wants to make sure his water is safe for his kids to get in, that kind of thing, okay? And uh, what makes our test strips a little bit different from the others that are out there, now, granted, we don't have a whole wide range of different test strips for everything else like some of the companies do, uh, but, but what we specialized in is making sure that, number one, the chemistries are correct, and that's the big thing. And a lot of it has to do with the pads and the kind of paper that you use. If you, if you notice, our pads are a little bit thicker, and then the other test strips, they contain a little bit more of a reagent, and they hold the reagent in the pad as opposed to it dripping off the, the test strip. Um, some of the test strip instructions from other p- companies will tell you to, you know, shake any excess off, hold a certain direction. You know, we're the same way. There's a certain technique to using a test strip. And we're very specific, for example, on, on when to watch for the color to develop. If you look in the back of our containers, it will say within the first 10 seconds, do a chlorine test. Then the next 10 seconds, do the look at the pH, then the alkalinity and hardness or whatever else is on there. So the instructions are pretty specific. It's not just dipping it in the water and matching the color right away. It's, it's not as simple as that. There is a little bit of a technique involved with it. Um, the big thing also, also with strips, and we talked about this earlier, was uh, the container that they come in, you, you can't, like a liquid reagent, you've got to close that lid. You can't let it be exposed to heat, light, and humidity, that kind of thing. Uh, you can't let it get wet. That's the big thing. Uh, because if you get it wet, the strips are pretty much no good. Um, uh, technique, you know, uh, using a sample of water from 18 inches down as opposed to 
skimming it across the surface. That's the 18 inch down sample is the right way to do it. Even though I know people who dip it in the surface and look at it and can't get away from that. I, I can't, a lot of can't be that. everywhere, you know, yeah. <laughs> slapping yeah. wrists. <laughs> right. um, but that's, that's what makes us a little different. And we always said, you know, we're, we're the preeminent test kit company in the country. And for us to have waited so long to come out with test strips tells you that we took our time. We did the research before we came out with this product, that we came out with a product that we knew would work and would work and would would be something proper under the Taylor name as opposed to just coming out with something really quick. And, you know, these these people come out with test strips that, well, they make other things, you know, pool noodles, inflatables. Oh, and by the way, here's a test strip. And they do bicycles. <laughs> and they bicycles, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, now, the, the other thing uh, that, that you were mentioning is that, you know, you've got uh, test strips maybe it's the, as, a, as, a, as a, the first level, then your, your standard liquid reagent test kit as the next level. What's next? Well, in the grand scheme of testing things, um, you've got test strips then at the bottom. Then you have um, uh, color matching for like a phenol red or, or a pH kit, uh, uh, excuse me, a sanitizer test in the 2000 kit, 2005 kit. Then you have drop tests. And then the top of the food chain for testing is anything electronic. So you're talking digital systems. You're talking photometers, spectrophotometers, colorimeters, things of that nature. Well, where you're not allowing um, your eyes to do the job for you, it's, it's an electronic-based kind of test. These are the, the portable colorimeters or spectrophotometers you might see uh, out in the field where you take a sample of water, you're, you're adding a reagent or, or whatever um, to, to the sample, putting it in a hole in, in a, what looks like a big meter, and then pressing a button. And then what that does, and, and the breakdown of it is, is that it sends a wavelength of light through that treated sample. And the wavelength of light is defined by what it is you're trying to test for. Like chlorine might have a different wavelength, pH might have a different leg, leg, uh, wavelength, etc. And then the outgoing wavelength is then measured and um, converted into whatever it is you're trying to test, a pH value, a chlorine value, an alk- whatever it happens to be. These are the ultimate in, in accuracy down to like three decimal places. Again, more is, mm, <laughs> three decimal places, a little bit anal as far as I'm concerned, but, but it still it gives you a very specific and exact answer. Um, but with anything digital or electronic, including little portable meters that you stick in for individual things, I don't care how much they cost or how good they are. If you can't clean them and you can't calibrate them on a regular basis, they're not worth the money. You have to be able to do that because residue can build up on probes and cause something called fouling, and you're going to get wrong answers. This is the same thing with, with um, inline systems that measure pH and chlorine. The, and the water goes through and, and it you know, reads it out. On the same thing, you've got to be able to clean them and calibrate them because after a certain point, they're going to get dirty. Yeah. You know, and, and you got to be able to do that. So so no real electronic um, digital pieces is worth their money unless you can do that. And there are some out there that you can't clean or calibrate. Mm. You know, those are the really cheap twenty dollar ones that you you pick up at Walmart or something like that yeah. or Home Depot or or whatnot. But yeah, so a good quality uh, digital system is is not going to be cheap. I'll, I'll tell you that it does cost some money, but it's worth the money. And it's worth the money also as long as you keep it keep it happy by cleaning and calibrating it. Right. Seems like something like that would be really good for brand new pools you've never, you know, dealt with before. And you're doing mm-hmm. kind of that initial, you know, water test that way. In mm-hmm. the very beginning, you know, you can kind of be proactive, you know, to mm-hmm. the uh, to the customer and say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, this is the first time testing the water. This is exactly what you're looking at, and it's you know impressive I mean? as hell. Yeah, when you carry that big case <laughs> in there, and you no, know, and that that that's that's a really that, good that idea. Goes a long way, yeah. you know, yeah. making that. And we always talk about that, like master your craft, be a professional, right? And if you do something like that, I really think because there's been you know numerous times, you know, years ago when they would take what we said and maybe take a water sample, and who knows, maybe it sat in their car all day and they took it over right. to somewhere else to have tested. And they're like, oh, well, they said this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, know. yeah. I hear all the stories. I took my sample to four different stores and got four different answers. 
why on earth did you take it to four different stores? Right. You know, you, were you not happy? Did you have nothing to do that day? You know? <laughs> and I'm broke now. <laughs> <laughs> I bought something I bought, from I bought every kit that, from every right. store. <laughs> Except me. You didn't buy anything from me. <laughs> All right, Wayne. Well, that's a lot of cool information. We yeah. appreciate that. Can you kind of just tell listeners maybe where they can find you, get a hold of you, have questions? Sure. Training. Training. Um, uh, like I said, um, uh, Taylor is located in Baltimore, so we're two or three hours ahead of here in Phoenix, um, depending upon <laughs> daylight savings time or not. Um, but um, our phone number is 800-TEST-KIT, which is 800-837-8548. That goes right into our customer service department. They want to speak with me. They can ask for Wayne. Uh, I'm there all the time, except when I'm doing this. Uh, my email address is very easy. It's Wayne at TaylorTechnologies.com. Our website is TaylorTechnologies.com. And you can reach us also uh, through the website. There's a couple different areas where you can send in emails or, you know, see our contact info, things of that nature. Uh, there's a ton of information on the website. I think you guys have, have probably seen it. Mm-hmm. Uh, between the videos and um, uh, uh, just uh, the descriptions of kits, what's available. The videos are the big ones. Um, we have a video on each test pretty much in that 2005 kit, how to do it. And they're not long, two minutes, maybe three minutes at the top, so you're not taking up a whole lot of time. Um, I also do webinars twice a week uh, that are um, sent out actually internationally. I've had people over in Europe watch them. Uh, that are recorded through GoToWebinar, and they're Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, my time from 3 to about quarter or 4 in the afternoon. But if they want more information on that, they can always email me or contact me or get a hold of you guys, and you guys can can let me know. But um, and, and I teach at trade shows and seminars and, and all over the place. Uh, what do you got coming up as far as uh, trade shows? What I have coming up, actually in two weeks I'll be at the Pool Industry Expo in Monterey. Um, I'll be teaching... Uh, believe I'll be teaching the basic water chemistry class and a class about the myths of water testing. What everybody thinks is right, but turns out to be wrong. Okay. I'll be teaching those two classes there. After that, it's the international show in Vegas in, um, in, um, the latter part of October into early November. Uh, I'll be teaching, well, which class I think I'm teaching class on water balance, if I remember correctly, but I'll also be teaching just prior to the show, a CPO class. Uh, with a, with a fellow instructor, Connie Sue Centrella, we've been um, tag teaming, teaching CPO class there for a couple of years for the international show. Very good. Cool. Yeah. Is there is there somewhere online that people can find the uh, testing treatment guide? Uh, actually, uh, we're we're going to be I think we're going to be putting that in a PDF format that people can download uh, straight off the website. Um, I know marketing is looking into doing that, but the, uh, what I brought you guys today is the latest edition. It's uh, dated May of 2018. I just recently updated it with some with some new information uh, about things that are happening in the street. Like we talked about borates and things like that. So um, that's all chock full of information right there. Thank you so much. And if you ever have problems sleeping at night, start reading that. You'll be out in minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this really waterproof? Uh, yes, it is actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Because we know we know techs the clumsy. <laughs> and they will drop that booklet in the water. And before we used to have boat version, but we just said, well, we just get rid of the paper version, just keep the waterproof version so that does not um, fade out or deteriorate. Oh, oh yeah. Cool. And your hands are wet 24-7. Yeah, exactly. Your exactly. hands are yeah. testing water mm-hmm. in the pool. You're, yeah. you know, emptying a skimmer. You're in the pump. Mm-hmm. Like, it's all wet. Yep. <laughs> yep. Should be anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we also have another booklet. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's called I Never Like Chemistry. And it's designed for homeowners. It's it's obviously not as heavy as as the booklet that comes in the kits, but it's a, kind of a lighthearted um, discussion of the things that you should be testing for and what to look for and things like that. And that's um, you can get those most of the time at any of the pool and spa stores on the counters. Oh, or right. call us up. Yeah, we'll send you one. Oh, very yes. good. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Wayne. You're welcome. Thank, thank you so much, Wayne, coming out here. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for listening. We loved this episode with Wayne, and we are so stoked that we got to share it with you. So we hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned tomorrow through Friday and also next Monday and Tuesday as we have designed a little mini-series on water chemistry for you. We spent a lot of time with Wayne while he was here, and we went over 
a bunch of different chemicals and how to use them, what they do exactly. It's a lot of knowledge. You don't want to miss it. So we will be releasing one every business day for the next six business days. And we are so excited to hear your guys' feedback on that. So if you have any questions, you can reach us at poolchasers.info at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our tag is Pool Chasers. If you guys could take a minute and go to Apple Podcasts to rate and review the podcast, we would truly appreciate it. See you out there, Pool Chasers. chasers.